All right, everyone, it is uh, 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Uh, the announcement for today is that we are soliciting nominations for Medical Grand Rounds for the upcoming academic year. Those nominations can be uh, dropped off on the homepage where Medical Grand Rounds lives in the Department of Medicine, or you can contact your division head uh, who will be uh, gathering nominations by division. So please send those in in the next coming weeks, and we'll remind you again shortly. I want to also remind everybody that uh, all medical grand rounds are eligible for CME and mock credit. So please use the message in the chat from Kelly Radar to claim your credit for this talk. And if you have questions for Dr. Frank as the talk is ongoing, please place them in the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, myself and the chief medical residents will monitor that and save all the questions for the end of the talk. It is now my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Joseph Frank. Dr. Frank is an associate professor of medicine in the Department of General Internal Medicine. Uh, here at the University of Colorado, and he is also faculty at the University of Colorado School of Epidemiology. He is the section chief of pain medicine, as well as the director of the Chronic Pain and Wellness Center at the VA Eastern Colorado Healthcare Center. He received his medical degree from the University of Indiana. He did his residency, as well as a chief medical residency at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. He then spent two years at Harvard as a general internal medicine fellow, where he also received his MPH in clinical effectiveness. Dr. Frank is a national and truly international expert on the management of chronic pain. He's a frequent uh, speaker nationally on chronic pain, substance use disorders, the use of opiates, as well as non-opiates in the management of chronic conditions. Uh, and his work has led to him even testifying before our Colorado State Senate here when issues arise that require his expertise. Uh, Dr. Frank is also well known to our residency and to our medical students. He's an accomplished educator, lecturing frequently on grant writing, epidemiology, study design, as well as uh, career development for young trainees. His work is currently funded by an early career scholar award from the University of Colorado related to chronic pain, opiates, and addiction. Uh, he is also the PI or co-PI on an NIH HEAL initiative, two VA query awards, and a PCORI grant looking at the effectiveness of two pain care strategies among uh, U.S. veterans on long-term opiate therapy. Uh, truly a, a pleasure to welcome today, Dr. Joe Frank. Great, thanks so much. As I get started, just to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Sounds great. Okay, and Michael, I'll just say I'm, I was hoping to share a little bit of video. I'm, I'm losing that toolbar at the top. If, if you're able to help with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and appreciate any guidance you can share. But, um, that was a really uh, thoughtful introduction. Thanks so much for the opportunity to present today on connection, meaning, and the future of chronic pain care. So I have no financial disclosures. As a VA employee here across campus, I'll note that the views expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the position policy of the VA or any other institution. The objectives for my talk today are to understand the current state of chronic pain care in the U.S., to describe evidence-based interdisciplinary care models for chronic pain and to identify recent scientific advances in the diagnosis and treatment of chronic pain. So I'll start off with a, a bit of a bold statement, which is to say there is a revolution happening in chronic pain care. I'm trained as a general internist and have cared for veterans, many with long-standing complex chronic pain for the past eight years, first in primary care and then for the past two years in our chronic pain and wellness center here at the VA. I'm also a health services researcher and have spent the past 10 years, some of which Jeff just described, studying how we organize chronic pain care and how we can more effectively and safely prescribe opioid medications. That said, there's a revolution happening in chronic pain care and how we understand and treat chronic pain. And like most of us, I'm just now learning about it. I come to this talk today as a generalist with some expertise in what doesn't work for chronic pain care. I've tried to use research to help improve the care of patients with chronic pain who are prescribed opioid medications. As part of our interdisciplinary team in the Chronic Pain and Wellness Center, we often work with veterans for whom years of treatment has failed to meaningfully improve symptoms of se severe persistent pain. And for a substantial number of these patients, sometimes treatments have actually caused side effects or real harm. But I also experience each day what does work, which is patient-centered interdisciplinary team-based care. That interdisciplinary care is rewarding and challenging and also quite humbling. I'm not trained as a psychologist or a mental health pro professional, as a clinical pharmacist or a neuroscientist, but I, I come, today's, come to today's talk with curiosity about how we can improve chronic pain care and well as with humility and skepticism knowing that that won't be easy. The uh, slide I was going to show here is, is a 
of a documentary, which I'll, I'll alert us to a little bit later if I'm able to sort out how to screen share a little bit better. But we're going to go ahead and move past that and dive right in with the basics. So what is pain? Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. This is a relatively new definition uh, updated in 2020 by the International Association for the Study of Pain. To make that definition a little bit more complicated, I'll identify a second definition for chronic pain. So this is from investigators back in 2014 who defined chronic pain as the consequence of plastic changes in cortical limbic circuitry leading to new learning and to memory formation that are continuously reinforced and thus cannot be extinguished. Well, that's a lot to take in. A lot harder to wrap my head around, but hopefully by the end of today's talk, some of that will make a little bit more sense. The International Association for the Study of Pain made several key notes in their 2020 definition, and one of the most important ones for me is that pain is learned. And I think about this in, in two important ways. One is that pain is learned in ways that we remember from our earliest memories. Many of us can recall the injuries, accidents, and bad decisions that involve lessons learned through pain. In most instances for us, this was learning with acute pain. Uh, and this experience that we've all had with acute pain shapes how many of us come to understand pain more broadly. If we skin our knee, we experience pain right then. If we really skin our knee, we really experience severe pain. And this apparent connection between pain and injury and the severity of the injury and the severity of the pain creep into how we think about chronic pain. And as we'll discuss today, this understanding of chronic pain uh, has been really challenged in the last decade by advances in neuroscience. But the second way we learn pain is unconsciously, involuntarily uh, at the level of the, our neural networks and autonomic nervous system. And this uh, reality becomes very important when we uh, catch up with our new understanding of chronic pain. The second note here is that pain is protective. It's, it's a good thing. Uh, pain helps us to protect ourselves, protect our bodies, uh, from further injury or future injury. It's a danger signal to help us take behavior, uh, to change behavior, to take some action to protect ourselves. And in that sense, it's highly motivating. Um, however, this protective me mechanism is often inaccurate, especially in the context of chronic pain. It's much more complex than simple nerve conduction and nociception and really not a good measure of tissue injury. And then more importantly, in chronic pain, this motivating protective mechanism can compel us to avoid activities and thereby take a detrimental toll on function and quality of life. And the third and final note that I'll start us off with here is that pain is biopsychosocial. So it's complex in ways that involve biological, psychological, and social context and causes, which brings us to today's first polling question. And so, Michael, I'll just note that I'm having difficulty. There we go. So this first question is, is from the brief pain inventory and from a shorter scale that some may have heard of called the PEG scale. Asks three questions, usually from zero to 10, but we're making the most of our, our Zoom poll here. And this question asks us one of the three PEG questions from one to 10 in the past week, asking each of you all as respondents, what number best describes how pain has interfered with your general activity? And the language I'll typically use as folks think about their answer here with uh, patients here at the VA is a 10 is total interference, no activity at all, pain fully interfered with general activity. And in this case, a one, pain interfered as little as possible, did not interfere at all. We'll take about 30 seconds to let people weigh in. Great. And so I'm, I'm looking at the responses and I'll give some feedback. We're seeing nobody reporting uh, a nine or a 10, a couple of people, let's see, about 15% reporting a six, seven or eight. About half of us say the lowest number of a one on this scale. And we'll come back to these numbers because it gives us a sense of how, how this audience, this group, um, I guess has a unique privilege compared to many US adults living with chronic pain. And that leads us into the first objective of where are we now? What's the current state of chronic pain care? 
So chronic pain is common and a major source of morbidity. From a recent CDC report, uh, the CDC analyzed 2016 national data and estimated 50 million U.S. adults live with chronic pain, and about 20 million report high-impact chronic pain. High-impact chronic pain for this study is defined as pain that limited life or work activities on most days or every day during the past six months. So um, what we also know from this report is that chronic pain is more common among some groups, women, older adults, adults living in poverty, and rural residents. And from other work looking at the National Health Interview Survey, we know that chronic pain is both prevalent and has been increasing in recent decades. And we see on the left here a panel showing men, on the right women, and across the three age groups study here, we say to see the prevalence of pain increasing over the time period studied right up until 2018. Uh, boy, things changed in 2019 and 2020 and since, and there have become, begun to emerge data uh, that during COVID-19 with stress and isolation and decreased access to resources, that these trends are likely further exacerbated. We know that chronic pain is costly. Shown here on the right is a report titled Relieving Pain in America. So way back in 2010, the Affordable Care Act asked the Institute of Medicine to put together this report. And some of the key findings from the, this report is that uh, chronic pain, pain overall, cost at that time an estimated annual cost of $635 billion. That's in both healthcare costs and lost productivity. Fast forward a little bit to 2016 and a study in which authors in JAMA estimated the annual cost of 154 different health conditions. In 2016, of those 154 health conditions, the two most costly health conditions were pain. The first was low back and neck pain at a cost of $135 billion. Number two coming in close behind was other musculoskeletal dis disorders at a cost of $130 billion. So we're providing a lot of care at great cost. And how are we doing in terms of outcomes? We know that chronic pain is challenging to effectively treat. Um, this image shown here on the right is a more updated report put out in a similar way, mandated by several U.S. departments, Health and Human Services, including the VA to develop a task force and produce this report on best practices, which was released in 2019. Uh, this report laid out the landscape of current treatment types and included medication, restorative therapies, interventional procedures, behavioral health approaches, and complementary and integrative treatments. And as we look at the table of contents of this report, we see that, boy, we're working from quite a toolkit. Uh, so we have options. But what we know about these options from this report and from multiple systematic reviews and meta-analyses of this list of treatments is that, as a rule, most treatments have been shown to have small to moderate effects on average. These effects are highly variable across patients, patient groups, and chronic pain conditions. And for many of these treatments, the strength of the evidence is quite low. With these treatments, many clinicians find chronic pain challenging to treat. But more importantly, many patients find the experience of treatment to be challenging frustrating and sometimes demoralizing. Many of us have worked with uh, patients or had the experience with uh, friends, family, or, or others in our lives and people struggle to identify a cause for their chronic pain symptoms and have the experience of trying everything and continuing to experience persistent pain. For the healthcare system, pain is increasing, costs are increasing, both moving in the wrong direction. Um, and importantly, as we are all aware, many of our current chronic pain treatments involve real risk of harm, whether it be medications such as opioids or interventional and surgical approaches in chronic pain management. And then finally, to complicate the picture one step further for many patients, our evidence-based treatments are inadequately available or difficult to access. Going back to this same 2011 Institute of Medicine report, we see there a highlight of the shortage of pain care specialists that report cited that for every physician board certified in pain care, there were then more than 28,000 Americans living with chronic pain. Because of the inadequate number of specialized pain physicians, we know that primary care clinicians are tasked with managing the majority of patients with painful conditions, often without the time, training, or resources to access 
pain care. And we know that access to behavioral pain management specifically is limited because financial incentives for psychologists and other providers are really lacking. Many insurance programs don't reimburse for behavioral pain treatments or reimburse at much lower rates than for pharmacologic or interventional treatments. We see this in a recent study uh, from the University of Michigan in which the authors of this study led by Dr. Pujalajasetti uh, used a secret shopper approach calling 366 specialty pain clinics across nine states. Shown here uh, in these bars from left to right are the different types of treatments that were offered at these practices. And we see to the far left that about all, 97%, offered some sort of procedural pain management. But if we follow this all the way to the right, we get further and further down before we see that about 10% of these clinics reported services that included medication management and behavioral health services. In a, another similar study by Dr. Lagasetti and colleagues, they use the same approach to contact primary care practices to understand access for patients prescribed opioids. And in this study, they asked these primary care practices about establishing care and continuing opioid therapy and a found that about 43% of practices said that their prescribers would not continue opioid medications. So looking ahead, it takes years to build expertise in chronic pain management. Uh, two years into this pandemic, we know that physicians, especially uh, in primary care where much of pain management happens, are, are pretty spent, uh, not clamoring to sign up for new CME activities to build this expertise. And the pipeline to develop these new providers is long. The final thing I'll say about the current state of chronic pain care is to zoom out a little bit and try and understand how we got here. I showed this figure earlier of biopsychosocial pain care, and it's important to acknowledge a disconnect from this ideal of biopsychosocial treatment to chronic pain, the disconnect between that and the reality of a healthcare system that for many of us is what I will call a biotechnological system. Uh, importantly, we care for patients who have often been given good reason to expect biotechnological solutions for their health issues. We can think of other chronic conditions that uh, clinicians across the Department of Medicine care for, whether it be diabetes or atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, and there have been really incredible technological advances in the treatment of these conditions. But when we think about chronic pain, we find that technological solutions, technological cures are awfully hard to come by. Moving forward, I'll try and make the case today that the path forward for improving the effectiveness, safety, and availability of chronic pain treatment is connection. To revisit the 2019 tax task force report that I just showed, I think we get a, a sense of the answer to an important question of connection to what. And so from this report, we see a consistent uh, overarching framework that the goal in chronic pain care, the future of chronic pain care is multimodal, multidisciplinary, and individualized. And this may begin to sound pretty familiar for those who care for chronic health conditions uh, in other settings. To expand on these terms a little bit, we, when we think about multimodal, we'll often use in the Chronic Pain and Wellness Center here the, this metaphor of a toolkit. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the importance of these metaphors, but this is an important place to start in thinking about multimodal. Any given treatment is going to be more effective when partnered with other treatments using the right tool for the right patient at the right time. Multidisciplinary, we talk about teams working together. Uh, we see an image of a team here, but I think too often for patients navigating chronic pain, the team that uh, is probably a better metaphor here uh, is a, a foosball table. You see that the players are structurally uh, impaired from getting closer together. I think in this metaphor, the patient probably feels like the ball in this game rather than a team participant. And then finally, individualized care, which we're going to talk more about as the talk goes on. From the VA, we have uh, good evidence on what evidence-based connection looks like. From a 2017 systematic review done here in the VA's evidence synthesis program, uh, the authors reviewed available care models and identified eight randomized trials and one retrospective cohort study of care delivery models that had been shown effective to support multimodal chronic pain care. The authors 
classifies the, the interventions into four categories based on the most common ways that these models had attempted to change care processes. And I think reviewing these categories helps us identify opportunities and barriers to future efforts to connect patients with evidence-based multimodal care. So shown here at the top is decision support focused on clinician teams. And I'll highlight three important aspects of decision support across these studies. First, formal identification of the teams and facilitation of frequent interaction of clinicians. So teams can't work together unless they know they're on the team, they know who else is on the team, and they have the space and time to actually meet. Second, regular symptom monitoring to inform decision-making was common in these trials. In some studies, this step incorporated technology to automate these assessments. And third, step care algorithms were often used to guide decision-making. The goal is to individualize care for each patient, but to avoid starting from scratch each and every time. Next, on the right, we see care coordination. These trials often employed a dedicated care manager. And importantly, these trials use different clinician types, whether it be a nurse or pharmacist or psychologist care manager. The key here really seems to be one identified individual who has the time, the leadership support, and the resources to be available in this role. At the bottom, we see patient activation and education. For the first two do domains to make an impact, patients must be engaged and informed about the team and the team's goals. Importantly, patients must be empowered to make progress with their own self-management, but as happens with any chronic health condition, there will be setbacks and they need to know who to contact and how. And then finally, on the fourth category here to the left, access to multimodal treatment highlights the importance of any of these steps occurring with system level change to remove barriers to those modes of treatment. In the VA, one of the steps we're taking to advance our understanding of team-based care is the VOICE study. It stands for the Veterans Pain Care Organizational Improvement Comparative Effectiveness Study. This is a trial funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It's an 11-site, five-year randomized comparative effectiveness trial of two care delivery strategies for veterans on long-term opioid therapy. And it's designed to meet this mismatch between the complexity of patient needs and typical resources, but importantly, is very much delivered under usual care conditions here in VA. Shown here are the ways in which veterans are randomized to either of these two teams. I'm going to say more about what I mean by TCM and IPT in just a moment, but importantly, veterans are followed for 12 months. So hopefully we're going to learn something about relatively long-term outcomes, including pain, function, and quality of life. To think about the first team, our telecare collaborative management team. This is the, the relatively low intensity arm and is led by a pharmacist care manager who is working directly with the veteran, building a relationship over that year and collaborating with a physician for decision-making support and controlled substance prescribing in this population when appropriate. We can compare that to the higher intensity team, which is our integrated pain team. So a medical provider, mental health provider, and some sort of rehab specialist working together with the veteran again, in both of these teams in partnership with a primary care provider. This study I mentioned is a five-year trial. We've uh, enrolled more than 800 participants nationally. And here, at least at our site in Denver, we just have a couple remaining patients who will finish their 12-month follow-up. And so we expect results from this trial, hopefully within the next few months to the next year. But with that context for the importance of connection, I can make just a few points about the future of connection in chronic pain care. And I think importantly first is coordinating the workforce. And in, in the ways I just described, we have multiple team options and opportunities for uh, clinical settings to identify the, the team and the resources that are available to uh, better coordinate and better clarify the teams that are working together. But importantly, I, I mentioned the training pipeline and, and the real uh, challenge of meeting the need with the clinician workforce that we will have for the foreseeable future. And I think it's important to note that we have an opportunity to expand the workforce. One of the ways that we're doing this in VA um, across the country and certainly here in, in, in the past year locally is to build on the VA's whole health program, which involves health coaching and peer support. We're launching soon here a group program, which will outreach and target veterans living in rural Colorado to work together as a group facilitated by peers but importantly, uh, further study is needed to understand how to connect the right patients to the right uh, options with coaching, peer support. 
And then finally, it is important that we think about the ways we can integrate available resources and develop new ones. We've all learned a lot about virtual care, as well as technology and self-management. This here shows the logo for the NIH is helping to end addiction long-term initiative, the HEAL initiative, and the Denver VA is part of a trial that will use that same pharmacist-driven care management model, but supplement it with a technology-based interactive voice response program, which will deliver, deliver behavioral pain care to veterans. So um, with each of these steps, we can improve access to the current multimodal treatment toolkit. But it's imperative that we also continue to expand this toolkit informed by the scientific advances of the past decade and empowering patients to better understand chronic pain and its treatment. Which brings us to what I've titled here, the future of meaning in chronic pain care. And in this context, the word meaning can mean many different things. It can mean for patients, uh, potentially an explanation, an interpretation, a new understanding of their symptoms. And for some patients, their lack of response to typical treatments aimed at symptoms or peripheral treatments targeting pain locations. For patients, meaning may also refer to beliefs about which treatments will work for them and why. And for clinicians, the meaning of a chronic health condition can often be captured by its diagnosis. I started this talk with the word revolution, it's a pretty bold word, but there are actually two revolutions happening at the same time. Modern neuroscience has made important advances in recent years in our understanding of chronic pain, its diagnosis, and mechanisms. And we'll talk about that momentarily, but that's just the first of two revolutions happening. At the same time, there's a new understanding of ways that we can use this knowledge for patients and clinicians to develop novel treatments that hold real promise. If this is the first you're hearing of new chronic pain diagnoses and new treatments, you're not alone. What this might look like would be an announcement that would say something like breaking World Health Organization scientists discover new type of chronic pain, diagnostics and effective treatments urgently needed. But to clarify what we would mean by World Health Organization scientists announced, uh, this is actually an update that happened just last month in January of 2022 when the World Health Organization formalized a new diagnostic approach to chronic pain with the release of ICD-11. So the new ICD-11 now uses a term called chronic primary pain. The so chronic primary pain um, is a key diagnostic category here and sits alongside chronic secondary pain. So in the right, you can begin to see in the top left chronic primary pain with its different types. Along the right, this new diagnostic approach includes multiple types of chronic secondary pain. Chronic pain, chronic primary pain rather, is defined as pain that persists for three months, is associated with significant distress and or functional disability, and is not better accounted for by another condition. But as we talk about chronic primary pain and chronic secondary pain, I think it's important to think about these on a spectrum. And this spectrum could be occurring with, within an individual patient at any time. We'll start here on the right, thinking about what we mean by chronic secondary pain. And so this would be pain that has an injury or, or tissue damage or a specific health condition that is causal, leading directly to the pain. I think somewhere in the middle is probably a, uh, an understanding of chronic pain that may be a little bit more familiar to many of us, which is that a cause of pain can be modulated, can be amplified, can be exacerbated by mood or stress or trauma or the social context which, in which it occurs. But I think where this really pushes us to stretch our definition of chronic pain is when we move all the way to the left to think that chronic primary pain occurs in the absence of tissue injury or damage or a specific health condition. And I think even more challenging for us to understand is when this occurs uh, with this red circular arrow on the right, is that the pain leads to stress and, and fear and anger, which causes more pain and on and on and on. I think a real challenge with this new diagnostic scheme is one that uh, when we last had the ICD-10 from the World Health Organization, it took us about 25 years to get it implemented in the United States. So it may take a while to see ICD-11, but I think the second challenge for patients is that this is going to feel for many to be a diagnosis of exclusion, like a new name for the same old problem of not really knowing what's causing the pain, which brings us to another Twitter alert. Breaking the Lancet announces a new third type of chronic pain, diagnostics and effective treatments for nociplastic pain urgently needed. 
And so in addition to this definition of chronic primary pain, we uh, now have an opportunity to learn about a pain condition called nociplastic pain. Uh, what we mean by nociplastic pain is a third type of pain alongside two other types, which we're all probably more familiar with. So nociceptive pain. This is gonna sound more like the secondary pain we just caused. This could be the relate of, uh, the, the cause of, I'm sorry, the result of ongoing inflammation, say in something like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, inflammation is ongoing and persistent and relapsing and remitting and is the direct result of nociceptive processes. Neuropathic pain we're also familiar with as well. Think about our patients with longstanding diabetes. But then our third group adds to these. We, we had previously lacked uh, a descriptor for the patients who didn't really fit into those first two groups. And again, the story is one of a mixed picture for most patients. This is going to look a little bit different for different patients. Some is going to be predominantly neuropathic, some predominantly nociceptive. But importantly, for understanding the potential impact of these, these new treatment options, it does seem like there are a number of patients in the millions of Americans living with chronic pain for whom nociplastic pain is predominant. So what to do with this new chronic pain diagnosis? I think a key first step is to develop and validate assessment tools. How can we reliably and consistently assess and diagnose nociceptive pain or chronic primary pain? The second is to assess the prevalence. Uh, we, we really don't know, and I think there's a lot of disagreement about what proportion of people living with chronic pain have pain that is predominantly nociplastic, as we're defining it here. And then a key step is going to engage patients and explore pain beliefs. This will be a real shift for many people um, and, and potentially be challenging and frustrating. And I think as we think about patients' stories, It'll be important for us to think about the ways we use metaphors and stories to make meaning out of this new diagnosis. And I'll start to think about metaphors that we already use very commonly in chronic pain. We often talk about and think about pain as the enemy, something uh, that we would describe as stabbing or burning. Uh, sometimes pain medications will be described as pain killers, and we'll talk about pain control or inadequate pain control. We use a couple different metaphors, one that can be effective in thinking about Primary pain or nociplastic pain is of our cars and the lights on the dashboard. And so sometimes we see a light on the dashboard that says check engine. Uh, we might take that car into the mechanic and get it looked, out, looked at. And sometimes they're going to find a cause of that engine light uh, with a problem. And other times they're going to tell us, you know, it's, the engine's fine. It's just the light that's malfunctioning. As we're meeting by Zoom today, I'll note that another decent metaphor for people with a a lot of Zoom experience over these last few years is that time where you have multiple microphones on and feedback, creating more feedback, creating more feedback. The other key steps with this new diagnosis is gonna to be to educate and train clinicians and other key team members, but importantly to develop and test effective models of care delivery. Which brings us to this man, this is a physician named Dr. John Sarno, who some may have heard of, who wrote a number of what I'll call non-peer-reviewed books dating back to the 90s and has developed to this day, even after his passing, a bit of a cult following. But importantly, that cult following has involved a number of clinicians who over the past number of years have been innovating and tweaking his methods to develop what I will define here as novel chronic primary pain therapies. I'm gonna go row by row here and identify some of the ways these approaches differ than where we currently are. Our current psychological therapies are agnostic about the mechanism of heterogeneous chronic pain conditions, whereas the novel therapies incorporate an assessment and specific education for patients on what is primary or nociplastic pain. Importantly, current psychological therapies will uh, share with patients that the brain can modulate or amplify pain, but a key difference here is that these new therapies can share with patients that the brain not only modulates, but also generates pain. These, our current therapies may not target or address emotionally difficult life experiences, where our novel chronic pain therapies note that these seem for many people to really be central to the experience of primary pain. Our current therapies seek to downrate like negative emotions, and some of these novel therapies actually identify emotional experience and expression as an important part of the change process. 
And then finally, our current therapies are often communicating to patients that pain can be managed and accepted and suffering coped with, but is very unlikely to be cured or resolved. And these new therapies can teach patients that pain can be substantially reduced or eliminated. I'm gonna highlight one here and I'll, I'll note you see me click through a slide, I'll give information about a really great documentary that has recently been produced about this particular therapy called Emotional Awareness and Expression Therapy. And I identify there've been a number of clinical trials in recent years looking first at fibromyalgia, where these therapies have had pretty impressive results in the number of patients who achieve substantial reduction in pain severity as far out as six months after treatment. You see here a clinical trial of 230 adults in which about a quarter had a 50% reduction with this emotional awareness and expression therapy compared to only 8% with our gold standard treatment of cognitive behavioral therapy. This therapy has also been looked at in adults with musculoskeletal pain where there have also been important uh, proportions who have had substantial improvement. And then beyond pain conditions, it's also been looked at in irritable bowel syndrome and in headache and shown promising results. Importantly, to bring us back one more time to this task force report, emotional awareness and expression therapy is already here identified as one of our gold standard best practices, but it happens to be in a place where very, very few people have heard of it and very few patients currently have access to it. I'll mention one other therapy that I'm gonna include in this group that was done just up the road in Boulder of a therapy called pain reprocessing therapy. This was studied compared to placebo or usual care. And what it seeks to do is just what the name says, which is to help patients reprocess or reconceptualize pain as a brain-generated false alarm. And it does so by bringing together components of other existing interventions, education, what is identified as somatic tracking or mindfulness, but then this important guided reappraisal, of false alarm, reinforcement of safety, and increasing positive emotions. And in this trial, um, again, the first trial of its kind of this particular therapy, we see pretty impressive results sustained at 12 months. Here on the left, the bright blue bar shows a drop in the average pain severity score from four to about one, and that was sustained all the way out to 12 months. And then all the way to the right, you see that about 50% of participants in this trial reported pain-free or nearly pain-free one year later. But again, these trials are early, and it'll be important to have more science peer reviewed and vetted to better understand the effectiveness of these treatments. It'll be important to compare the effectiveness to evidence-based treatments I mentioned, such as cognitive behavioral therapy. It'll be important to explore these treatments among diverse patients in a range of treatment settings. It'll be key to engage newly trained practitioners. Most of these trials have been done by the expert clinicians who developed the treatments to explore how to integrate these therapies into multimodal treatment and to deliver them virtually and in groups to improve access. But they're gonna face a lot of headwinds, I think. Um, one of the challenges will be that brain-based diagnosis and treatment is, for lack of a more clinical word, kind of weird and tough to wrap my head around at least, and it's gonna be stigmatized for some patients. I think understanding patient stories is gonna be a critical step. These treatments involve supervised and graded exposure, but exposure to pain and to unpleasant emotions can be unpleasant, and this so is not initially gonna be for everybody. Third, clinicians are pretty exhausted. And so we have to uh, really think about where these new clinicians are gonna come from. Who are the people who are gonna sign up for these trainings to build this into their practice? And then to the structural barriers we talked about earlier, insurance coverage, out-of-pocket costs and access are gonna be variable and likely will not be equitable right at the start. And it'll be important to keep a close eye on that. In conclusion, multimodal, interdisciplinary, individualized chronic pain care is achievable and effective, but we work in a system where structural barriers remain. In addition to tackling these structural barriers, we need to think creatively about how to engage patients and connect them with individualized support and resources. The science of chronic pain has made important advances and dissemination to patients and clinicians is urgently needed. And finally, novel psychological treatments hold promise to leverage these advances to expand the chronic pain care toolkit. As I conclude, I wanna say thank you to all the folks who I have the pleasure to work with who make this work possible, our team at the Chronic Pain and Wellness Center and our Center of Innovation, 
mentors, collaborators, the Department of Medicine's Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program, and funders for some of this work. I hope to share a little video, but I think we didn't have time for that anyhow, but I'll just note a couple of really interesting documentaries that are still relatively recent to dive into these methods and the, the folks who have created them, as well as some excellent coverage recently of, of these trials that I alluded to, both in the New York Times with a series from last November, really great Washington Post editorial from li late last year as well. And with that, it looks like we have plenty of time for questions and I look forward to your discussion. Dr. Frank, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate that talk. And we do have a number of questions, so glad we have some time. The most common was, where do I access those documentaries? So I'm glad that you were able to, to hit that at the end. And I vote, uh, maybe we can even head back to the QR code. Yeah, perfect. Great, thank you. Um, um, and I'll just note, I, I had a really interesting conversation just this week with the documentary filmmakers for the one on the right, This Might Hurt. This is um, a documentary that explores the experience of one group going through this emotional awareness and expression therapy. Um, they're working on a shoestring to disseminate this and are interested in uh, helping us host screenings. And so if, if folks are interested, please reach out to me directly. If you check it out, we can um, certainly, I would love to take the lead on exploring something like that with uh, the one here on the right. That's great. Thank you. Um, start with a, I think, a, a sort of a common a question that's come up with several times in the chat here, which is, um, given that no, pain is notoriously difficult to describe to others, um, how have the new therapies addressed the difficulties some patients have describing or validating their pain to physicians, um, especially when psychological mechanisms for pain can be difficult to identify? Right. Um, I think uh, one of the ways these new therapies seem to approach this, and I'll, I'll just note that um, these are therapies that we are looking forward to integrating into our team here, but uh, I'm, I'm learning from others just as everybody else is. It's, it's really a detailed assessment up front, um, at least in pain reprocessing therapy. As an example, there is this real focus on uh, developing evidence of cr primary pain. And so asking patients to describe in detail where the pain is, how it moves, what makes it better, what makes it worse, is actually part of that initial assessment to help sort of... Uh, ask for patient's feedback when, you know, that doesn't make sense for pain to be in your shoulder one, one moment and, and now it moves to the other shoulder and, and now it's on both sides. And so that can be an important part of the discussion to sort of make space for that description and to identify the places where the fact that we can't explain it um, with a structural or anatomic cause at the place that hurts is actually good news. It, it uh, begins to fit with this diagnosis of primary pain and, 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 for some patients, we'll give them hopefully some optimism that it's worth exploring these treatments. When, you, when we're talking about this idea of primary pain and, and the last example you showed of an effective therapy, the idea of pain reprocessing, how do you teach your patients the difference between you know, a false alarm or to use your example, real engine trouble? You know, If the light that says the engine's overheating is always on, how do they know when the engine is actually overheating? Great. Um, I think it's a very important question. And I, I should, could have included it on a list of barriers. I think um, that's, I think, going to be uncomfortable, certainly for me and for other clinicians who are new to this. I think we're um, going to be asked to come to these discussions with some certainty and confidence to provide reassurance, um, but to acknowledge that, you know, no, no assessment, no diagnostic tool is going to be 100% specific, and so occasionally we may get it wrong. Um, you know, I guess I'll then make a connection to the middle part of the talk, thinking about connection. That I think with this program, there's going to be relatively intensive short-term follow-up pain reprocessing therapy, for example, with twice weekly sessions for four weeks. During that time, they're going to get a lot of feedback, but to think about connection after that, it would be important to be providing structured guidance on who to call when something changes. Um, because like I, like I described, there will be people who are experiencing multiple types of pain. And so for those people, it may be that the nociplastic or primary components improve with a treatment like pain reprocessing therapy, but the other components don't. Um, and it'll be important for those patients to be able to contact uh, a provider or team with those updates. Uh, the one other comment I would make there is I, I suspect there will be perhaps liability concerns that you know, that's a level of re reassurance and sort of predicting the future to patients that, that some of us uh, you know, may be, be careful in how concretely we can predict the future. 
Um, and so there may be some clinicians who view that as a bit of a barrier to entry to getting into these therapies. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question that came up commonly as you talked about some of the novel therapies that are out there um, and that are well studied is, did the studies showing the significant pain reduction from those therapies require uh, a reduction in opiates first? Or were patients on opiates mm -hmm. enrolled in those studies thinking about the real world patients that our primary care doctors are taking care of? Great. Um, you know, I think the, I'll just come back to this table here. Um, in most of these studies, they have not systematically uh, oversampled or recruited patients prescribed opioid medication. So I don't think we yet know how these treatments uh, work or, or um, do not work for patients prescribed opioids. I think that'll be an important outcome in future studies and certainly one that, as we're thinking to the uh, patients that come to mind for us in our practices, um, opioid use as of the year 2022 tends to be a pretty good uh, surrogate for you know, complexity of pain, duration of pain. And so those are the patients we're going to be most concerned about. Um, I can see, I, I could hypothesize ways that you know, ongoing opioid medication use, especially very high dose opioid medication use, perhaps with cognitive side effects or, or other side effects could limit a person's engagement with some of these treatments, which do, you know, require specific uh, attention and engagement and homework. Um, so that'll be a barrier. And I think um, an important place for future study is, is that population. I think the one other group that I would add where I think our team has discussed this a little bit here at the VA is, you know, for patients who have had back surgery, sometimes multiple back surgeries, and really do have complex anatomical abnormalities, um, which would make it challenging to recommend confidently to that person that there is no injury, there is no damage, with it, which is a common refrain with a treatment like pain reprocessing therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely. Switching uh, gears a little bit, um, and it's a bit of a long question, but the crux of it comes at the beginning, which is what are your suggestions for inpatient providers? And then the question asker goes on to describe, you know, what a lot of the common barriers are, which is that a lot of the folks that, you know, work in inpatient medicine uh, want to help, but then they know that their patients don't have regular access to outpatient providers. They may have maximized other non-opiate therapy, or at least as best you can do in the inpatient setting. Um, and there isn't great access to, you know, regular pain management clinics for a lot of these people. What do you, what do you offer to the inpatient doctors listening today? Right. That's an important question. I think it's, I'll, I'll answer in, in two ways. One directly related to the presentation and the second, um, uh, throw sort of a, a curveball in that I didn't spend much time with. I think uh, the first is just to identify, I think that the context in which a discussion and diagnosis of primary or nociplastic pain is going to matter. And I suspect that the inpatient setting will be really challenging. I think it's going to benefit from rapport and a relationship and, you know, a, a few days in the hospital for, you know, what is clearly an acute pain episode, you know, is probably going to be a, a pretty limited context in which to have these conversations. And so I think you know, the questioner is alluding to what I might call harm reduction in the hospital and at hospital discharge, attempting to try and avoid, you know, initiating strategies that may um, be problematic for that patient after discharge and a real limitation to, um, at least in the short term, how we could sort of effectively bundle these into a few days. Uh, though I think an important um, future avenue for this work. Um, so that's the first answer. The second answer, I'm gonna see if I can zoom forward and find another slide here that um, we included right here. So a, a piece of the voice study that I didn't mention and, and my second answer to the question is, for patients, especially those prescribed long-term opioid medications, is to get familiar with, be prepared to discuss and prescribe alternatives to full agonist opioids, in this case, buprenorphine. And so one of the uh, second study arms in the VOICE study, which I described, is uh, including buprenorphine in the discussion. And here in Denver, we've had a number of patients who are very interested in making a change. And the inpatient setting can be, I think, a reachable moment for initiating that conversation or initiating that uh, medication changes, especially with a new diagnosis of opioid use disorder in addition to pain. Yeah, thank you. I think that makes good sense. And one of the other the sort of uh, a follow along question to that was, you know, and I don't know if this is something you want to talk much about, but how do you keep the physician patient relationship, you know, 
well uh, when people may come to you expecting a medication-based advice? How do you sort of start and, and continue that conversation with your patients? It's a, uh, a really important question. I'll, I'll note that this is one that our team um, talks a lot about and got a message from one of my colleagues just this morning about uh, an interaction when it, it, it went less than well when the recommendation was that uh, we, we didn't recommend medications. Um, you know, I think key to that is um, starting with as much time as possible to hear from the patient, their experience and their story. I think it's going to be difficult to make that recommendation when a person feels like they didn't even have a chance to describe how they how they have lived with chronic pain and why they have this particular preference. So that's an important place to start to then empathize that you know, for many people who have lived with chronic pain for years or decades and have found that nothing is particularly helpful, um, perhaps compared to say an opioid medication, uh, that's important to acknowledge and empathize is a really difficult spot. And then I think the skill that I continue to work on is to be short and sweet in recommending that I don't recommend you know, this treatment, this medication, because I'm concerned that the harms would outweigh any benefit it would do you. And I think that when I'm able to be clear and concrete and then pivot to recommending, but we'd like to help connect you with these other alternatives. Hopefully those are alternatives are, uh, you know, as long a list as we can put together, um, that can help that conversation at least uh, transition into the next one, which is less focused on medications, perhaps less focused on opioid medications. But I acknowledge it's um, certainly a challenge. And you know, as of 2022, I think patients who find opioid medications to be helpful for them are often reporting to our team that they feel a little bit under siege. You know, they feel like they've their sort of uh, access to these medications has been chipped away at and really threatened. And so people you know, start from a place of fear, and, and that conversation can be really difficult. Yeah, you can imagine. There are a couple uh, questions here about the data that you showed about increasing uh, pain trends. One is, uh, is this, is this the same, is this a U.S. trend or is this a worldwide trend that you're talking about there? And the other question relates to whether the increased prescribing of opiates preceded the trends and, and maybe a part, maybe in some ways causal, or if we think that that is following along with these increased trends that we're seeing either nationally or worldwide. Yeah, I mean, I'm Zoom all the way back here. Um, so this is this is just U.S. data. What I'm showing here. This is from a uh, an ongoing federal survey called the National Health Interview Survey. Uh, so just looking at the U.S. here. Um, and importantly, I, what we're looking at here is less chronic pain and more pain overall. Um, you know, I guess I would be concerned that the you know if we over overlay the prescription trend for opioid medications, we would see it continue to rise dramatically, and then right around 2014, 2015, start to bend in the other direction. Um, and so I think at the population level, it's hard for me to see a real connection to say that increased prescribing or decreased prescribing is making a dent in either direction here. You know, I think that's a, uh, at the patient level, that's a different conversation. At the, at the national level, certainly the increased prescribing we saw from the start of this study of 2002 through about 2014, didn't seem to have a meaningful benefit in reducing the prevalence of pain, reducing the severity of pain. Yeah, makes sense. And do you know if similar graphs, uh, similar to these U.S. graphs, exist worldwide, or do we think that this is more of a, a local phenomenon to the U.S. or and or the developing world, developed world? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm uh, one of the resources that I began to tackle in preparation for for this presentation is uh, sort of a, a global survey. But I I'll confess that I um, don't know exactly how this would look in other developed or developing countries. I, I think in many ways, when it comes to chronic pain and, and pain management, the U.S. tends to be an outlier. That was certainly true for uh, opioid medications. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure there would be similarities, and I suspect that the U.S. is on the, on the relatively extreme end of the spectrum. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And can you talk about how these new pain control modalities um, are addressing some of the racial biases that we see in the prescription of pain medicines. Are, are, are people who are running these studies thinking about racial bias as they run them? Are we applying these techniques equally? Do you have any sense of that? Um, you know, I think they're early enough that, again, the, the, the trials that I showed um, 
have not looked at this specifically to my knowledge. I do think this is a really important moment if we're thinking about expanding research in this area and then expanding access to these treatments. I think there's a real risk that it would um, enroll and then become more available in all the communities who already have uh, relatively good access to other treatments. You know, as an example, the pain reprocessing therapy trial was conducted at, at CU Boulder, enrolled from CU, and enrolled a really relatively well-educated, uh, well-to-do group of um, Boulder citizens. And so that may not give us important information about you know, what the experience would be, what the effectiveness would be in different communities. Um, so I think it's an important point to say that you know, a key step in um, advancing the science here is going to be to specifically enroll patients who have perhaps not been included. Um, and I think to, to the questioner's example as well, who have been you know, uh, specifically and systematically undertreated uh, with other modalities in other places. So it's I think, an important moment in the development of these therapies to um, be very intentional, about making sure we don't do that again. Yeah, I completely agree. Thanks, Joe. And I said one other question that I want to uh, send it over to Dr. Chopra uh, as we finish up here. Uh, somebody in the audience asked, have, have the therapies you're talking about, the novel treatments for pain, been tried for other neurologic conditions, such as restless leg syndrome or similar things? And do we know if they are effective in any other conditions? Great. Um, I'm going to stop with this picture here of Dr. Sarno and to note that, you know, there were, there were a number of things that he did not have the benefit of, including, you know, functional brain imaging and neuroscience advances. He used a term called TMS, tension myositis syndrome. That's not a diagnosis that has aged particularly well, um, but he also identified TMS equivalents. And so certainly from his clinical experience, he began um, to identify some of these other conditions that seem to occur in, in, in similar ways or seem to co-occur in similar patients. Uh, there was one trial of emotional awareness and expression therapy that um, I'm aware of that looked at irritable bowel syndrome. Um, but I think in, in theory, at least, uh, this should be relevant to a number of other conditions that you know, we previously haven't had great treatments for. This could be things like chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, you know, I think there is some com conversation about sort of the mind-body aspects for some people of um, long COVID. And so I think it's certainly timely to think about what's the range of conditions where this could be useful, um, but then to acknowledge that, boy, it's going to take specific study for each of those conditions to, I think, reassure us that we're um, not misapplying this, this technique uh, when we should be looking elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, makes good sense. Uh, and then as we wrap up here, Dr. Chopra, uh, questions for Dr. Frank? Yeah, one comment, Joe, Joe, and one question. First of all, great grand rounds. It was actually very, um, uh, there's a lot of new information that even I learned about just thinking about this differently. The first comment is around uh, a book that I think uh, is worth uh, mentioning to everyone here. It's called Empire of Pain, which uh, I, I don't know if you've read yet, Joe, but it's actually a book about the Sackler family and Purdue Pharmaceuticals and their contribution to kind of the opioid crisis. And it's not just about OxyContin. It's actually a very interesting social psychology story about how business and profit uh, came into healthcare. And so I think there's uh, lessons there for all of us. But Joe, my question for you is, you know, when I'm next on wards and I meet that patient uh, who basically says, I've been dealing with this for a while, you guys can't do anything for me. G give me one piece of wisdom that you think I should interject at that point in time on that first conversation. What would I do differently given what I've heard you talk about today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, again, uh, in the context of the, of the time constraints that I can, I can vaguely recall from my, my work on the wards, I think it's beginning to um, ask the right questions and plant that seed that we're, we're learning that chronic pain involves the brain in important ways that we, we shouldn't ignore. That specifically treating the pain location with um, you know, structural treatments, peripheral treatments are, are going to have limited benefits when that's the case and to create a space for patients to share whether or not they feel like that resonates with them. I think the real challenge in the hospital and everywhere else, quite frankly, is that it's really gotta be a one-two package, I think. For the patients who do find this, this resonates with them and they're interested in treatment, they currently can't really find it. Um, and so that's gonna be a real shortfall in you know, planting that seed if the person leaves the hospital is excited about what they heard from you, Dr. Chopra, and finds that 
there's nobody in their community, there's nobody in their city or state offering these things. And so you know, I think um, that makes it a real challenge in that setting. Um, but I think it does seem like a key piece of this is uh, information. One of the phrases that Dr. Sarno used in one of his books was sort of that this is a little bit like blowing the cover off a covert operation for patients. And so some patients are gonna identify this as something that really hits close to home. And for those people, that may be a big step forward. Um, acknowledging the, the real challenges of scaling up the infrastructure needed to meet them at that next step and guide them through these therapies. That's great. I think a perfect place to end our, our talk today. It's one o'clock. So uh, Dr. Frank, thank you very much for uh, being at Medical Grand Rounds and for uh, reporting out on this important topic. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity.